But I want to start with Psalm 37 today. There are a couple of psalms that are really interesting about dealing with people in conflict. And Psalm 37 I really enjoy because it talks about those who oppose us, those who are evil doers. And we have great encouragement from the psalmist who has joy in knowing that they will be taken care of. These guys who oppose Jesus will be taken care of. Those who oppose us and our beliefs will be taken care of because the Lord is an avenger. And so the word of the Lord, Psalm 37, do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious towards the wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. And he will bring forth your righteousness at the light, and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the of man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil doing. For evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, but he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight in abundant prosperity. The word of the Lord from Psalm 37 today. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for comfort in the words of the psalmist today. We see a lot of evil in the world. We see a lot of wickedness in the world. We see people who mistreat others. We even see that in our institutions, Lord. They're not perfect because perfect people do not exist on the earth. But we know, Lord, that you are the righteous judge. You will evaluate all the works of men, those who know you and claim your name, as well as those who don't know you and do not claim your name. Your eyes see all. In Revelation 1, we see you with eyes as a flame of fire, looking at the churches, looking at the people, and you will judge righteously. And we thank you with great comfort, those who trust in you, Lord, those who put our faith in you, that you will avenge us when evil is done against us. We do not need to take revenge on our own because you are the avenger. We need to remain faithful. We need to remain patient. We need to remain in your will, Lord, that your will be done in our life, that you build us up, that you give us patience and you give us circumstances that require patience because you're training us to be like the Son. And to be like him is to be one who is a follower, who followed God the Father to the nth degree. Lord, help us today, even as we worship, even as we sing songs of praise to you, help us today to bow our head, to bow our plan for our own lives to your plan for our lives. Thank you for joining us in celebration. We sing because we love the King, and you are our King, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, my brothers. The reading of the Word today is from John chapter 5, verses 16 to 23. The word of the Lord. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, 
and I myself am working. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus therefore answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, unless it is something that he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him that you may marvel. For just as the Father raised the dead and gives life unto them, even so the Son gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, in order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Last time we were talking about Jesus healing a paralytic man. The man had been wounded and ill for 38 years. And we were talking about how Jesus intentionally called this guy out for healing in the midst of a great crowd. Somebody who was well known, somebody who everybody in that area knew probably by name. He'd been there day after day after day, year after year, decade after decade. He had been around. And Jesus particularly chose this guy for healing. Because as we said last week, Jesus intentionally healed this guy where there would be nobody to refute the fact that he was ill and then now he was able to get up and walk. Jesus had that miracle power where he could just heal somebody with a word. And he heals this guy on the spot. When we ask the question, did Jesus purposely heal on the Sabbath? Did he purposely heal on a day that he knew if he did that, he was going to draw ire from the Jews who monitored the Sabbath? And we said, yes, he did. He intentionally did that. He told the man three things. Get up, take your pallet, and walk. And the man did exactly those three things, obedient to the words of Jesus to a T. And then we see the man go into the temple area. And then Jesus meets him in the temple and why is he in the temple? Because he's thanking God for his healing. And we said two things about that. When God has healed you, you're immediately obedient to him. And we say when he becomes your savior, he should become your Lord. You're obedient to him when you're saved by him. Salvation has a lordship component to that. And we said we should be praising him for our healing and praising him for our rescue, just like this man was praising him straight away in the temple. But Jesus was highlighting by healing on the Sabbath Jewish hypocrisy. And we said, and we read the commandment, thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. You should have a day of rest. And as the interpretation we talked about last week, that was a personal interpretation. Whatever you did for work, you were to take a day off where you didn't do that. And that was for us. God intended that for us to rest. And even in our generation, even in our workplace, where's days of rest? Some of us get Saturday and Sunday off, two days of rest. Others only get one day of rest off. But it's a great opportunity to talk to people who don't know the Lord saying, you know what? Your weekend is biblical. And it opens the door to have this conversation. But the Jews were a little bit more refined in their ability to control that freedom that we had from the commandment. And they wanted to make sure that it was legal 
It was isolated and it was well communicated. There were 39 things that you could not do on the Sabbath day. 39 specific things, and if you violated those man-made rules interpreting what the Ten Commandments said, you would be called out. And Jesus specifically called them out. And they didn't like that at all. And we pick up in verse 16 of John chapter 5. We pick up where we ended last week. John 5.16 says, For this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing things on the Sabbath. This was the beginning of the animosity to Jesus. Jesus knew it was going to happen. He purposely did that to instigate them. Why did he do that? Why would he instigate them for a response like this? We find the answer to that question today as to why. The words there in the original language say it was an instigation that started and never ended. Their persecution of Jesus began here and never ended. It just got hotter and hotter and hotter until the very end. Why? Because Jesus was calling them out as hypocrites. And there were certain examples we talked about last week where they said, hey, your priests work on Sunday, but that's not a violation of your 39 rules that you came on top of the commandment. Who has a sheep that's going to fall into a pit and you're not going to pick him out? on that particular day because it's the Sabbath. You're just going to leave him there all night long to potentially suffer or get killed by a wolf or something like that. Of course you're going to pick him up. You guys don't even follow your old rules. Why are you trying to push your rules on me? And they didn't like that. He uncovered their hypocrisy. And then the second thing they didn't like is he led his people, his disciples, everybody who heard them, to follow along with Jesus. You don't have to obey these guys' rules and their fire and anger furied against him from this point on. And I asked the question, was Jesus an anarchist? Was he a guy that just wanted to rile everybody up? He wanted to upset the apple cart. He wanted to turn over the Jewish legalism. He wanted to turn over Rome. He wanted to break from all the traditions and start fresh and anew. Was he an anarchy kind of guy? We said, no, not at all. Of course he wasn't. He just didn't like the hypocrisy. He didn't like the man-made interpretation of God's law. It was inaccurate. And what was supposed to be a break for mankind, they turned into a shackle for mankind. And we have to... Consider our own behavior. Have we done similar things to this? Have we taken our particular view of tradition and said you can't do this or you can't do that and imposed it on people when that's not what scripture said to do? And we'll find in our own personal lives sometimes we do similar things to that. Now it may not be blatant hypocrisy. It may be calm or passive hypocrisy. Like you can't smoke. Because that's in the Bible somewhere, I just know. Or you can't drink alcohol, because that's in the Bible somewhere. I, I don't know where, but I know it's there somewhere. And those are legalistic examples. And we say, where stands it written? If we're going to hold somebody accountable to something in the Bible, we better know where it is. And we better have the correct interpretation for that. These guys didn't have that. They had a horrible interpretation of what was supposed to be a restful commandment. And he called him out about it. But was he an anarchist? Of course not. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 tried to explain the commandments to a, a good group of people. He's up on a hill and he's teaching and he goes through the commandments one by one. And he says, you've heard it said but I say to you, and he's interpreting that. That's what John in John chapter 1 verse 18 said he would do. He explained God to us. He interpreted what God intended to us. He was a life example of interpreting what God meant. Because God's word had been maligned over the years by Jewish priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, and other people. And so he came to correct the story. 
give us the straight truth. It's the straight dope. And in Matthew 5 at the end, he had a word about the law because people looked at him and saying, you're telling us things that are different than what we've been told. And he says in Matthew 5, 17 to 20, do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Whoever then annuls the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. If you malign the truth, if you twist the truth and you lead others away from the truth, judgment is going to hit you. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he goes on to, to say, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. If the scribes and Pharisees are listening to this scene, they are seeing the mirror put up to them. And what Jesus is saying is the scribes and the Pharisees were certainly not prophets. And they certainly didn't understand the law. And unfortunately, we have a lot of people that we call false teachers that don't understand the Bible either and yet teach it and lead people astray. It still happens today. And we have to teach the truth. But verse 20 is something that is very interesting at the end of this passage that Jesus said. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're better than these guys, you're not getting in. You're not part of the kingdom. You better be better than these guys in their interpretation because they're not getting in. That's pretty much what he says if you read the lines. These guys aren't getting into the kingdom. They need to repent because they're going with their man-made laws and man-made rules contrary to what the intent of Scripture is, and eventually they're going to run into a stumbling block or a stone, and that name is Jesus, and he will crush them. And this had to weigh heavily on the people as they're listening to him because they thought the scribes and the Pharisees were the religious elite. They were the top of the top. They were the big dogs. Man, if these guys can't get it, what do I, how can I get it? If Billy Graham would be an example for us, if he's not in, I got no hope. I got no shot. Billy was very clear about his theology. He knew what he knew and he taught what he taught. And he was very cognizant of teaching the truth and not going outside of the reins of that. And he is a great example. The scribes and the Pharisees were not. They were not prophets. And they were acting like prophets. And so Jesus hits this head on in this passage. And he says, we are a, a team. John 5, 17 says, but he answered them and said, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. And he's talking to scribes and Pharisees, and he's saying, look, my dad's working, and so am I. I work along with my dad. And I said last week, do you think God stopped working on the Sabbath day? Did God stop working on the rest day? Even though he created the world in six days and he said he rested, did he stop from all of his activities on the seventh day? He didn't create anything, but he didn't stop all of his activities. He rested from his creative work. We learn from the Apostle Paul in his writing that Jesus was a part of that creation. He was a part of that. We look at Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or at authority. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And then this last phrase, and in him all things hold together. If God stopped working, if he took a day off and didn't work, 
things on the earth and in the universe would unravel. Because it says Jesus holds all things together. Think about this. There are a lot of issues in the world. How many of these things are natural occurrences that we have as trauma situations? If you would talk to the people in Hawaii that live next to a couple of volcanoes, they would probably think, man, this is some bad stuff. They're little cracks <laughs> that are in the strata of the earth. And sometimes the pressure from below pushes up lava out of those cracks. And that heated central core starts showing up on top of the earth. Can you imagine what would happen if God did not hold everything together? A geologist once said, looking at the structure of the earth, we live on a fireball that could blow up in any minute. That's true. We live on a fireball, and it could blow up in any minute. Can you imagine what would happen if Jesus wasn't holding all things together? The world might blow up in an instant if he is not working. So I write in the notes, thank God he is working. Because these little fissures that show up with lava runs will turn into an absolute explosion of the world. And that's from an unbelieving geologist just looking at what he knows about the planet. God controls everything and holds it all together. And Paul teaches us that. But I said earlier, why did Jesus highlight the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. He wanted a platform, Jesus did. He wanted to be able to say something. He wanted to be able to tell these guys something. He wanted to record it for all time. And what he wanted to record for all time was that he was God. He was God in the flesh. They would ask him several times, on whose authority do you do this? Why are you cleansing the temple? Who gave you the right to do these kind of things? And his answer in all of those cases is, God, the Father, gave me the right to do that. Because I am him. I am with him. And if we look at our belief of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they were all God. They are all God. And we have to recognize that. There are a lot of people who teach that that's not true. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that Jesus was God. They'll stand on your porch and say Jesus was a created being. Jesus was an angel. Jesus was just a guy born that God blessed him with the Holy Spirit. He was just like us. There are people who actually teach that you could be God just like Jesus is God. Like, wow. I didn't realize I had so much power available to me. All I need to do is name that and claim it, and I can be God. Wow, that sells pretty well in some churches, right? The problem is, it's blatant heresy and error, and it's going to lead you to the pit of hell. But there are people who teach that. But Jesus wanted to tell these guys something. He wanted to set the record straight. In the early part of the Gospel of John, Jesus said, or excuse me, John said, he wrote, the Word was God and the Word was with God. He said early on, his premise statement, Jesus was God. And here he brings the number one witness to the table. What do you think, Jesus? Are you God? And he says, yes, I am. John 5, 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The Jews recognized what he was saying. This guy thinks he's God. He thinks he's God. Does he have a God complex? Now, how many of you wives think at times your husband has a God complex? You think he's got, the, he's got the God complex. He's telling me what to do this or what to do that. And to be honest, how many husbands say that their wife are that way? <laughs> we all have those things in our relationships from time to time. How many times have you run into somebody and they're talking with great boast and they think that they control it all and everything revolves around their world and we say they have a God complex? The Jews thought Jesus had a God complex. 
They thought that there was something really off with him, and they all the more sought to kill him because he said he was God. I wrote in the notes, do you know what Jesus was indicted for? Do you know what the charge was against him that the Jews put forth so that they could crucify him and convince the Romans to put him to death? It was blasphemy. That was the charge on his charging statement in his indictment. He said he was God. And he did. But was it really blasphemy? <laughs> I wrote in the notes, I once heard, once heard it's not boasting if you can back it up. The guy was boasting about all of his great skills. He happened to be a basketball player on a basketball team I was playing against. And he told me he was going to take me left. He was going to take me right. He was going to dunk over my head. He was going to blow me off the court. And I looked at him and said, doing a lot of boasting. And he said, it's not boasting if you can back it up. Truth be told, he did exactly what he said. <laughs> he took me left. He took me right. He dunked on me. I didn't do well that day, and I was a defensive player. So, man, it's not boasting if you can back it up. In this case, Jesus was God. It wasn't blasphemy because he was, and therefore he backed it up. And we'll see as we go further how he backed it up. As we go through the rest of chapter 5, you'll have witnesses that will show up of how he backed that fact up. We'll hit one of those today. So if Jesus was God, he wasn't guilty of blasphemy. So they're going to kill him because they have a charge against him. Jesus knew it was coming. He knew what was going to happen. Matthew 21, he had this parable. Matthew 21, 33 to 42. He tells them, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it. And then he built a tower. And he rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine, growner, vine growers to receive his produce. Give me what you owe me. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and then killed another and then stoned a third. And again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first. And they did the same thing to him. And the landowner was upset. And then it says, but afterward he sent his son, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said amongst themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and then we can seize his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. They killed the son. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Jesus' parable, I sent you slaves to talk about me, to collect wages from me, to collect obedience, to collect worship. Those names were the prophets. And we could go through the list in Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos. He sent them all to him, and what happened to these guys? Isaiah was killed, sawed in half, if you believe Hebrews 11 from that. The prophets were all killed, and then the heir shows up. And what did they do to the heir? They charged him with blasphemy, and they executed him on a cross for his blasphemy. It should be no surprise that they would kill the son because it happened exactly as Jesus said in the parable. Jesus was God and they decided they wanted to run the world and so they thought, I'm going to kill God. And that's what they attempted to do. In John 5.19, we learn a little bit more from Jesus. He says, therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something that he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son does in a like manner. Truly, truly, or the old King James says what? Verily, verily, truly, truly. When you see that, 
Jesus is standing up and saying, I'm telling you the truth, guys. It has emphasis. You need to listen to me. I'm giving you straight dope. It's important stuff for you to listen to. He says the son can do nothing of himself. And what I take out of that is he follows the father's lead. Jesus is so aligned to what the father wants to do in his life that he always subjugates his will to the father's will. Can you imagine what these conversations are like early in the morning? All right, it's a new day. What do you want me to do today? Get my orders, my commands from the father. What am I supposed to do? Parents, wouldn't you like it if your sons or daughters came to you in the morning and said, okay, mom, okay, dad, what do you want me to do today? And that they followed everything to the letter that you asked. Sometimes when the grandkids show up at the grandparents' house, we long for those days too, right? <laughs> Just do what I tell you, you know, to have a willing, following participant that will do that. But that's the way Jesus was. Even back to a young age, remember he was age 12 and he went with Joseph and Mary into Jerusalem for the celebration. And Joseph and Mary leave him there. They mistake, mistakenly wake, go away from Jerusalem on the way back home and leave Jesus there. And it takes them a good day to figure out Jesus is not there. This is not exactly a good parenting example, <laughs> by the way, right? Where is our son? He's our oldest son. Where is he? And it says, after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And then his mother and father show up. And Mary says, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. But what does Jesus say in response? Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? I'm following my father's will at age 12. John 6, 38, we'll talk about here in a few months when we get to that. Jesus said what his purpose was. For I have come down out of heaven not to do my own will, but the will of who, him who sent me. He says, whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. He's following the father's plan. We see it again and again. John chapter 12, 49 to 50. For I've not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. He was following down to the point of his father's words. He was so in line with the Father's will. This great passage in Philippians 2. I love this passage. Paul is teaching the Philippians of an example of how to have a Christ-like attitude. And he says, Philippians 2, 5-9, Have this attitude in yourself which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of him, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above all other names. Jesus God, Paul says, became a man, humbled himself, emptied himself. If you do a word study on that word in the original language, he poured himself out. He let glory pour out of him and took on human form. I can't imagine what that was like. The best example when somebody asked me that question, it was a young girl about 10 years old, I don't understand that, can you explain that? to me and I said let's let's say you live in a nice house let's say you live in a nice house and you have your own room let's say you have your own room and you have toys all over the place and you have a beautiful bed and you have all these great clothes that you get on and you have food whenever you want it by going to the refrigerator and let's say you say I'm gonna leave this house 
and I'm going to go live on the street, and I'm going to sleep on the pavement, and my pillow is going to be a rock, and I'm not going to have a covering except branches that I could pull from a bush. I said, what would that be like for you? She says, I wouldn't like it at all. And I said, I wouldn't either. But that's the closest as I can come to. He came from glory. He had it all. Everything was there for him. And yet he emptied himself. And he came down to earth and lived like one of us. And he said, the foxes have holes. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. God in the flesh coming down. Why? Because he was doing the will of the Father who told him, this is what you will do. You will do. you remember at the very end when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane? He's praying. He says, i got to go pray. And he asks the disciples to come pray with him. And they all fall asleep on him because it's a long time in prayer. What does Jesus say? Luke 22, verses 41 to 42. He knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus subjugated his will to the Father's will. Even in the last day of his life, from the beginning we see at age 12 to the end of his life, the very days before he would be crucified, he went for the Father's will. And so he followed the Father's lead. And I write in the notes, how much more should we be faithful to follow God's will in our life with that great example that Jesus gave us. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, the disciples asked the Lord how to pray? Teach us how to pray. What does Jesus say? Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray for God's will in our life, not our own will in our life. So if we subjugate our will to the Father's will just like Jesus, then we'll become more like Jesus. And so we should do that. And then back to the passage in John, Jesus says, For the Father loves the Son. And shows him all things that he is doing. Now, my father was a great woodworker. He could do anything with his hands. He loved this. If I joined him in his workshop. And he's like, see what I'm doing here? This planer? I bought him a shopsmith. My first job where I met my first check. He always loved working with that. So I bought him a shopsmith. You guys know what that is. It has all these different component tools on this one machine. And I go up to his house in Michigan after I had that delivered, all proud, and I watched him use all the same old tools that he used in the past. And I'm like, have you used this for anything? And he goes like, nap, I got all my tools, I know how to do it. And I stay there with him a little bit. And I'm like, there's a lathe over here, Pop, we could play with the lathe. And I could see the joy on his face when I spent time with him in something that he loved and he was showing me things and the joy was not because of my success in replicating what he was doing. The man had a creative ability I couldn't touch. But his joy was the facts that he was showing me how to do it and I was paying attention to him. So I could say that to the carpenter children when mom is showing them something. How much joy is it when you're able to communicate to your daughters something? How much joy is it, Colby, when the sons watch you as you're teaching them something and you are learning by watching them, the parents lead? And so we go back to the scripture here. The father loves the son and shows him all the things himself is doing. Do we have any evidence in Scripture that the Father loved the Son? Is there any moment in Scripture that we have that we can refer to where the Father communicated his love for the Son? Earlier in John chapter 3, we have Jesus' words. He says the Father loves the Son and is giving all things unto his hand. That's John 3, 35. 
But then we have this baptism event. You remember the baptism event, Matthew 3, 16 to 17? After being baptized, Jesus came up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming down. And it landed on him. And a voice came out of the heavens. What would the voice say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Again at the Transfiguration, Matthew 17, 1 to 5. An event where Peter, James, and John are taken up on a mountain. And Jesus pulls his skin back, in essence. And his radiance of glory of what was inside the Son of Man shines over the entire mountain. Probably hit the valley. If you were in the valley, you're looking up and going like, what's that? His glory all over the place. And at that moment, when his glory is revealed, the Father from heaven says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Peter, James, and John heard it. How many people were at his baptism in the river by there? Could be hundreds and hundreds of people. It sounded like thunder from heaven. But God said, I love my son. He is my beloved son. Two times from heaven, God speaks about his love. Should be no surprise that the father loves the son. But there's another reason. Not only because of his nature, because that he was one with the Father. There's another reason why the Father loves the Son. We find it in John 17, verse 7, or excuse me, John 10, verse 17. That's the Good Shepherd parable. And he says, Jesus does, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so I can take it up again. The father loved the son because he sacrificed his life. He filled his role. How many times do we like it when we give a command to our kids, Colby, and they do it without question? Does that ever happen? (laughs) But when they obey, (laughs) you're helping him out, Corbin? (laughs) But when they obey what you ask right away, and then they go do it. Wouldn't you like that, Mom? You give Bailey a command and she immediately goes and does that. And your love for her just overwhelms and gets even greater and deeper. And that's what we learn. In John 17, the Lord has this high priestly prayer. And he says this, you loved me before the foundation of the world. That love relationship started in the beginning before the earth even was created. And continued on all the way through the sacrifice on the cross. All the way through his resurrection. And now back up into heaven. The same love relationship is there. And what a joy it is. We experience some of that. And I'll just say some of that. When our son, daughter, grandchild, grandson, granddaughter actually do what we ask without question. And we just smile. And it's like, I love that kid. And Jesus felt the love of the Father because he did what the Father asked him to do. And then we get to John 5, 20 and 21. What else is Jesus telling these guys? He says, And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. Probably if he... Inhabited a Canadian rock group, he would have said, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. And that's what he's telling these guys. You think you've seen some stuff so far? You're going to see some other stuff. You're going to see some greater things that you will marvel. That word in the original language is wonder beyond belief. You're going to see something that's going to blow your mind. And then he goes on to say, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son of Man also gives life to whom he wishes. What do we learn from that? There's going to be some raising from the dead. We are going to raise people from the dead, and it's going to blow your mind. Greater works 
definitely when you can take somebody who's dead and bring them alive again. How many times did it happen in the Old Testament that God raised somebody from the dead? There's two that I know. Elijah in 1 Kings 17 raises the widow's son. The widow doesn't have anybody to help her, doesn't have anybody to protect her, and she's absolutely beside herself when her son dies. God has pity on this widow and raises the son back to health and life for his mother. In 2 Kings 4, we see Elisha do the same thing for a Shunammite woman, raises her son. Two examples in the Old Testament of raising from the dead. Jesus in John chapter 11 is going to talk about this guy named Lazarus. And when we get to that passage, we'll hear he was sick unto death and Jesus waits around for two days before he goes over to deal with the family. He purposely waits two days so that Lazarus is good and dead. And he wanted everybody to know he was good and dead. And then Jesus raises him from the dead. And he called himself the resurrection and the life at that point. But after he raises Lazarus from the dead, what was the reaction of the Jews at that point in time? John 11 Verses 47 and 48. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council. And they were saying, what are we doing with this guy? He's performing all of these great signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. We're going to lose our place. And then they say, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. We've got to stop this guy. Because we're going to lose our place in society if we let this guy go. They're the ones in the vineyard when the sun shows up. I like the way it's going right now. I want to control everything. I want to make my 39 rules on the Sabbath day. I want to rule the people with iron fist. I don't like this guy coming and stirring everything up. We've got to get rid of this guy. And then they plot to kill him. But there's another aspect of what Jesus says here. He says, even so the Son gives life to whom he wishes. Yes, he raised Lazarus from the physical death, but there's a spiritual life that he's talking about here as well. Romans 8, Paul talks about this in verses 10 and 11. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And it harkens back to Jesus talking to Martha in John chapter 11 where he says, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Jesus controls spiritual life. He controls physical life. He controls spiritual life. He's God. The first day of your life, the first breath you take, the last day of your life, the last breath you take, he controls it all. And I write in the notes, do you have this spiritual life in you? Do you feel that the Holy Spirit lives in you? Are you secure that you know without a shadow of a doubt your last breath here will be your first breath in glory with Jesus? You do if you bowed your head and you accepted him as Lord and Savior of your life. You have that assurance. And once you've done that, you can't lose it. You will experience the first death, maybe. If the Lord comes while we're still alive... And he carries us up into heaven when we're still alive. Young Bailey had that question written down for me today. What is this taking away when believers will be taken away in front of unbelievers? And we call that the rapture. And if the Lord comes while we're still alive, it says he will take us up in an instant, in the blinking of an eye. And I asked her to blink her eyes in front of me as quickly as possible so she could blink, 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 blink like that and that's how fast and we won't experience the second death ever 
which is separation from Jesus for all time. But those who do not have the Spirit of God in them will experience not only physical death, but spiritual death, which is separation from God. Like last night in the movie, the character said, I can't change the terms of the deal. No matter what I would like to do for you, young people, I can't change the terms. That's the terms. We have to understand that if you do not have Jesus in your life and your earthly life ends, separation from God is what your future is. And those are the terms. We have to understand that. And then Jesus goes on to say, John 5, 22 and 23, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. If you have not bowed your knee to Jesus on the earth, it's just a matter of time before you do. You either bow your knee to him here, or you bow your knee to him in the future. He says, for not even the Father judges anyone. He's given judgment to the Son. Now the Son came to save the world. We learn that in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But verse 17, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. In his incarnation, when he came the first time, he came as the Lamb, the Lamb to be slain. He didn't have a judgment role at that time. But Jesus says, I do have a judgment role in the future. From this point in John 5 to the end, I will be given judgment. And we see that in Matthew 28, after the resurrection, before he gets taken up into glory. What does he say? Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He now has judgment capability. We see that in Revelation. Read Revelation chapter 1. Just read through it. Eyes like a flame of fire, feet like burnished bronze, absolute white clothing, pure judgment. He's going to be able to look at our life and see everything. You can't hide anything from him. And he's going to have feet of burnished bronze to stamp out sin and to judge sin. And if we don't have a Holy Spirit passport that says, I'm, I'm under the blood of Jesus, here's my Holy Spirit passport separation from God and judgment will hit us. It's a serious thing. It's serious. But John records Jesus' words, all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He's given these guys a warning. There is a time when you will be forced to honor me. And we go back to that passage in Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should, what? Bow. Of things in heaven, things on the earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue should, what? Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself when he came to earth. He followed the plan that the Father had perfectly. And for that, he was given a highly exalted name. And he was given the ability to judge who's in the kingdom and who's out of the kingdom. Jesus is the only one. Confucius ain't getting there. Mohammed ain't getting there. Salt Lake City Church of Latter-day Saints ain't getting there. There are a lot of people who teach that you are determining your fate. Because you can name it and claim it. It's a bunch of lies. Only Jesus controls it. If you don't know the Son, you're in bad shape. Because he's the only judge. 
if you got hauled in front of a court for a violation and you had a relationship with the judge, you might think he would go lenient on you. You need to know who the judge is and have a relationship with him because, frankly, your life could end at any moment. That movie last night, the lead character in the movie had stage four cancer and didn't know it. And he was gone in an instant. And life is fragile. And it can go away in an instant. And I go back to Psalm 2, where the psalmist gives good advice. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. Good advice from the psalmist. Kiss the sun now when you have a chance. Give your life to the sun now before it's too late. Because one day it might be too late. You can kiss him now while you're on the earth, or you can cower to him later when he returns. It is your choice. Unbelievers have a difficult time understanding how Jesus can be God. And I love to take them to the Garden of Gethsemane. Because a lot of unbelievers show up in the Garden of Gethsemane. A Roman legion shows up. You remember this? The Roman legion comes to get Jesus. Judas is there. He's going to betray Jesus with a kiss. That's not the kind of kiss the psalmist is talking about. Jesus goes over and kisses him, says, this is the guy that you're looking for. Jesus looks at these Romans and says, who do you seek? And Jesus simply says, I am. What do the Romans do? What do the unbelievers do? At that time, you go back and read that passage. Everybody face plants. They don't have a relationship with Jesus. But at his word where he says, I am, every unbeliever in the place face plants and bows. That's a picture of what it's going to be like in the future when he comes back again. Everybody who doesn't kiss the sun will face plant. And that's what Paul says to the Philippians. Every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So I'll end with Jude 24 and 25. We've been studying Jude on Sunday evenings. These are the two verses that are left. And we'll talk about them tonight at the beginning of our prayer and praise night. Because this is what Jude writes. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to prevent you, present you, excuse me, faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God and Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Because when you have a relationship with Jesus, now you are able to be kept from falling. What does that mean? You're not going to lose your status. You're not going to lose your salvation when you have a relationship because it's him who keeps you from falling. And he will present his own faultless before the presence of his glory with joy. And when you, at the end of your life, face him and see him face to face, as Paul told the Corinthians, when you see him face to face, it won't be cowering in fear. If you've kissed the sun, it will be joy. Because you get to see your Savior face to face. So Lord, your word is clear to us. Clearly you said to the Jews, you are God in the flesh. Clearly you proved it. You did all of the works, all of the miracles, all of the things that you did highlighted that something was special about you if they could see it. 
But if there was any doubt in their eyes, you told them plainly, you're working just as the Father is working. The Father loves you. The Father shows you what he's doing. And for your sacrifice on the cross, he loved you to the nth degree. And he made you judge over mankind. And you are the righteous judge. There will be no debate when we leave the earth and see you. There's only one question. We don't have to fill out an application. There's only one question. Did you kiss the sun? Did you know Jesus? Did you have a relationship with you? And Lord, I pray everybody in my hearing, even in the sanctuary here today or later on if they watch the message on our YouTube channel, I pray that they have kissed you. And I pray that they have a relationship with you. And I pray that they have confidence and will have exceeding joy when they see you face to face. Thank you, Lord, for being so clear in your word, empowering John to put these words for us, that we can see them and we can trust in them because you are true and you said verily, verily. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the spirit to help us interpret it today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Jeffrey Plummer. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. Our sermon video is available on our website, which is www.cbccne.org. On that website, you will find sermon video as well as a blog that I write each week to our fellowship here at the church. At the top of the website in the corner, you can see all of those links that can get to that information. You can also learn about our church with our church history in the About page to be able to find out what we're all about here in Cambridge, Nebraska. Again, I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today, and I pray that you have a blessed day.